Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And I shouldn't have had you sit already. You've been some because we need to read the scripture. So <clears throat> have you ever felt felt just discombobulated? That's how I feel <laughs> this weekend, just discombobulated. Everything that could go wrong seems to go wrong. So would you, if you would, please uh, humor me and please stand uh, in honor of God's word as we read John chapter 5, verses 24 through 30. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of him who sent me may God bless the reading of his word please be seated George Bernard Shaw observed the, a really fascinating statistic he says the statistics on death are really, if you think about it, they're very, very impressive. One out of every one person dies. George Whitfield, who was a very famous pastor and evangelist, he once told of a time when he saw some criminals who were going to be hung for their crime. And they were being transported from the prison to the gallows in a, a, a horse cart. And he happened to hear them in the cart talking to one another as they were going by in the street. And he said they were arguing in the cart of who would get to sit on the right side of the cart. Now think about that. Where were they going to be hung to death and yet they were bickering with each other about who should sit on the right side of the cart well you know that really should chill our hearts it certainly chills mine because i think that's what really what so many people today they are like when it comes to the subject of death in light of death's certainty it is a certainty you think that people would be more motivated to be prepared for what lies beyond. And yet so many people, they simply want to push it out of their minds. They want to ignore it and not focus on those things that really matter for things that don't really matter. Sadly, the church in the United States has kind of contributed to this mindset. We have not preached as we should have preached about these serious matters. We ourselves have become uh, so focused on the temporal that we neglect the eternal. Pastor John MacArthur expresses really what I would say is my concern as I look at the landscape of the American church today in particular. Here's what he said. He says, the church has stopped talking about eternal life. Everything is about fix me here. The gospel doesn't promise to fix you here. You may have a bad marriage till you die. You may have bad kids till you die. 
You may have cancer and die before you thought you'd die. You may lose all your money in the stock market. Your house might burn down. Jesus doesn't promise to fix that. Contrary to what you hear from the health and wealth and prosperity teachers, the only people who seem to get wealthy off of that are the people who take your money. The gospel does not promise that, but it does promise eternal life. <clears throat> Jesus' resurrection conquered death. Jesus is the answer to the problem of death, which every single one of us faces. He is hope beyond the grave. In fact, let me put it this way to you. Christianity, our faith, it really makes no sense if there is no forever. You ever think about it that way? This makes no sense if there's not an eternity, if there's not a forever. Now, let me balance this out. John MacArthur, nor myself, we're not saying that those problems that he mentioned, that there's not solutions to them. We're not saying that they can't be fixed here. But what does it matter if there's no eternity after you die? What does it matter if... Your marriage gets fixed, but then you die and go to hell. What well, does it matter if you get all your money back and then you die and go to hell? Christianity only makes sense if the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection because of his is true. In fact, that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 19. That's his whole argument, really, for that whole chapter. If Jesus Christ is not raised from the dead, he says, then everything we do is in vain. Your life is in vain. What I preach is in vain. Your faith is in vain. It's empty. It's meaningless. See, if our hope is based in wishful thinking, it's worthless. I mean, think about it this way. If a doctor gives a, can a cancer patient a pill that promises that this pill will cure you of this cancer you have, even though he knows it won't, the patient may have hope for a while, right? But it's a false hope. Eventually, the cancer is still going to, what, get him. And so here's the thing. If I am going to offer you hope today, I have to tell you the truth. I can't sugarcoat it. I can't try to avoid it. I can't dismiss it. I can't lessen it. Or try to say, well, don't worry about that. I would say this, no, worry about that. But here's the truth. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't mean hope for all people. That's the sad reality. It doesn't mean hope for all people. Now, it offers hope, but it only offers those who have responded in faith to Jesus Christ alone. If you have not put your faith in him, then it doesn't offer you any hope. Well, that brings us to John chapter 5, verses 20 through 30, 24 through 30. And Jesus here in this passage is continuing his defense of himself against the Jews who were attacking him. The Jews here had accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, which was a no-no for them, but also they were offended because he had claimed to be God. Look what it says again in verse 18. 
It says, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And before Christmas, we dove into that section there. And so Jesus is continuing this defense, if you would, and this discussion with these Jewish religious leaders who are upset with him. And today, he's going to, get, he's going to put more to them about and hammer home who he is and why it matters. In fact, today he makes a very amazing claim. And it challenges us with a very important question. And here's the question. Are we ready for the resurrection? Are we ready for the resurrection? Jesus' death and resurrection guarantees that there is a resurrection for us. And Jesus plainly taught that he, he's both a risen Savior and a risen judge. We will all be raised. Some will be raised to eternal life, and some will be raised to eternal judgment. And since death and judgment are an absolute certainty for every single one of us, our text, if you would, it screams at you to pay attention and to make sure that you are right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And since Jesus Christ is the only one who was fully raised from the dead, it would be wise for us to listen to what he has to say about this matter of eternity, wouldn't it? I, mean, I kind of just make that my policy. Somebody raises us from the dead, I tend to listen to what they're going to say. They, they might know something. That's really what's going on here. That's actually what's going on in verse 24 and then verse 25 when Jesus says, truly, truly. The old King James says, verily, verily. What's he trying to say? He's trying to say, wake up. Don't fall asleep right now. This is the time to listen to what I'm trying to say. And so Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. And in our text, Jesus really stresses three main points. The first point is this. We are all either spiritually dead or we are spiritually alive. There's only two categories. Verse 24, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now, clearly, when it comes to physical life and physical death, there are really only two groups of people. We know that. This is not hard to understand. But what is true physically is also true spiritually. There are only two groups of people. Those who are spiritually dead, those who have eternal life. There is no in-between when it comes to spiritual matters. The difference is that those who have eternal life, they have heard and they have believed Jesus' word, whereas those who are spiritually dead have not believed. And hearing Jesus' word is the same thing as hearing God's word, because Jesus is equal with God. That's what he's stressing again. If you're listening to me, guess who you're also listening to? You're listening to God. And so hearing Jesus' word refers to more than just hearing the sound of his voice. You're not just hearing him talk. It means listening, right? Now, we know this. Parents, this happens to me all the time. My kids heard me, but they didn't listen to me, right? They heard me squawking. They heard the sounds coming out of my mouth, but they weren't actually processing the information. Because when I said, what did I say to you? Um, I don't know. I knew you weren't listening. Well, that's what's going on here. So you can hear the sound of Jesus' voice, but that doesn't mean you're listening to it. And obviously, the Jewish leaders 
who are challenging Jesus right now, they hear Jesus speaking. They hear the sound of his voice, but they didn't accept what he was saying. They didn't want to believe what he was saying. <coughs> Excuse me. And in spite of the witnessing of this amazing miracle that Jesus does at the beginning of chapter 5, the Jewish leaders now oppose him. They now reject him and his claim to be sent by God. Again, if somebody got healed in front of you, and we're talking about truly got healed, would that make you take notice of the one who said, hey, you know what? This guy's been lame from birth. Get up, walk. And he gets up and walks. I'd take notice of that. And they noticed it. They saw the miracle happen. But they didn't understand what the point was. And so they hear Jesus' words. But they don't accept it. They don't put their faith in it. That's what it means for us to say, I hear what Jesus says. It means to believe what Jesus says is true and then to submit your life to it. To believe his word results in salvation here. To reject his word results in condemnation. If you listen to Jesus' words, verse 24 says, you'll have eternal life. If you don't listen, you will remain in death. And I love what Jesus says. He adds here that those who have eternal life, they believe that hit in him who sent me. They believe in God. Pastor Leon Morris points this out. He says, all those who really believe the Father accept Christ. It is not possible to believe what the Father says and to turn away from the Son. The theme of this whole passage that we're seeing is the unity of the Father and the Son. Meaning, if you reject Jesus, guess what you're also rejecting? You're rejecting God the Father. And if you reject God the Father, you're rejecting Jesus Christ. And we emphasize that because so many people want to detach that. Well, I believe in God. Well, do you believe in Jesus? No, I don't believe in Jesus. Well, then you don't believe in God. Or not the God of the Bible. Because you can't have one without the other. Christianity is not a buffet. Where you get to pick and choose the parts you want to believe over the other parts. And notice Jesus says that the one who hears his word and believes in the one who sent him has eternal life. How can I be ready for the resurrection? Verse 24 is my answer. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ as your savior from sin and judgment? Do you believe the biblical witness that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who died for your sins and was resurrected by God's power. If so, then notice what verse 24 says. It promises you eternal life. This is one of the greatest verses on the believer's assurance. He says, the one who believes in Jesus Christ, he has eternal life he does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. And I want you to notice in this verse, the verb tense. Eternal life is a present reality. You have it right now. He doesn't say you will have it, does he? This is not a future thing. Eternal life for the believer is right now. That's your possession if you've believed his word. You've moved from spiritual death to spiritual life. And the life God gives to those is not temporary life. It's eternal life. To put it another way, if you can lose your salvation, then it's not eternal. God wants those who believe in Jesus Christ to have assurance. That's what he's saying in Romans chapter 1. Excuse me, chapter 8, verse 1. He says, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That word condemnation is judgment. 
You will not be judged if you're in Jesus Christ. See, eternal life is not based upon my efforts. It's not based upon my reasoning. It's not based upon my feelings, but it's based upon the unfailing word of Jesus Christ. Can I trust God and his word or not? And he promises that those who believe have eternal life and they will not come into judgment. And so either we trust it or we don't. There's a story told about a man who once came to the fa uh, famous evangelist D.L. Moody. And he said that he was worried and he was really struggling because as he described it, he says, I don't feel saved. So I'm concerned that I'm not saved because I don't feel saved. And Moody, who was very wise, he simply asked this question. He says, was Moses, oh, excuse me, Moses, was Noah safe in the ark? The man thought for a minute. He said, certainly he was safe in the ark. Well, Moody then said, next, what made him safe? His feelings or the ark? The ark, right? Not whether he felt safe in the ark, but that he was in the ark. I mean, he could have been in the ark, safe, the doors closed, and feeling, oh man, are we gonna, is the boat going to sink? Are we going to all die still? But that didn't change the reality of what God had done, did it? No matter how he felt about it. See, our salvation doesn't rest on, I feel this way. It rests on Jesus Christ as our Savior, and it rests upon his word. And so if I am in Christ, then I am secure, and I am protected from the storm of judgment that is coming. And so verse 24 is both a statement of fact, and it's an invitation for us to hear Christ's words and to believe in him. The second thing we see is this. Only Jesus is powerful enough to impart eternal life. To spiritually dead sinners. That's really verses 25 through 26. And Jesus says there that there is an hour that is coming, and then he says it's now right here. That phrase really kind of beckons back to uh, the woman at the well, right? When he spoke to her about worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. There's a time that's coming when you're going to do that. In fact, that time is now. He meant that it's a present reality but also that there is more to come. And in this case, the more to come Jesus is talking about is there's going to be a cross. There's going to be his resurrection. There's going to be his ascension. There's going to be that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And as we get farther into John, we're going to see that unfold more and more. Now is, speaks to that Jesus has the power to say to the dead, arise and live. And of course, we know he's going to demonstrate that power in John's gospel when he calls out Lazarus from the grave. When he says in, in John 11, 43, four, excuse me, 43, Lazarus, come forth. And with that command, Jesus imparted supernatural power to, for that dead man to hear and obey. Here's the bottom line. Only God has such power. Only God can raise the dead. And so that miracle is a proof of Jesus' deity, and it's also a signpost pointing to Jesus' power that he has spiritually. He can raise spiritually dead people. That's really what verses 25 and 26 is focused on. Now think about that. If we were at Lazarus' tomb on that day, would you be amazed if a dead man, after being dead three days, came out of the grave, all wrapped. And you were there. You knew he was dead. There was no way that he was alive when you put him in that tomb. We'd be amazed, right? Well, Jesus says, just as Lazarus is raised instantly at the command of Christ, so dead sinners are instantly saved when they hear the word of Christ and believe. Is that you? If you put your faith in Christ. And verse 26, 
Jesus explains why he can impart this life to those who hear his voice, because life is inherent in God. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son that he has life in himself. Jesus is the source of life because he is the creator of life. Life is in him. Now, here's the distinction. It's not that God possesses life. God is life. All life comes from him. Apart from him, there is no life. And the Father has now given that to the Son. It's again another claim to, for Jesus to say, I am equal with God the Father. Well, the third thing we see is this Jesus will raise all the dead of all ages and then judge them for all eternity. Verses 27 through 30 gets really serious because it's talking about judgment. For Jesus claimed to be true in these verses. He had to be raised bodily from the dead. And I want us to know just a couple of things in these verses. In verse 27, we see that Jesus' authority to judge, it comes from God the Father. And notice that Jesus, not God the Father, he is the judge. We will stand before the judgment of Jesus Christ one day. And that's actually a reference back to Daniel chapter 7 where the Son of Man was given everlasting dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all people might serve him. Jesus is the Son of Man, eternal God in human flesh, uniquely qualified as a human to judge. But at the same time, he's also God, so he's all-knowing. He is the God-man. And that's a good thing for us. In fact, John Piper stresses it this way. He says, why is this such a good thing? He says, God deems it fitting that human beings be judged by one who knows what it's like to be human. Isn't that what we got just done celebrating? Christmas, the incarnation of Christ. He knows what it means to be a human. And not just a human, but one who suffered to deliver the rest of us from judgment. There is something suitable that the one who sentences men to heaven or to hell would be a suffering savior. That the judge of all men will be able to look into every eye and say, I too was tempted. I too suffered. I understand. I know what it means to be human. Of course, we know as we saw the distinction is Jesus was without sin. He is the perfect one. And verse 28 and 29 tells us that he will raise all people to face judgment. Now those present that day must have been really scoffing at this claim. And so Jesus warns them not to scoff. Or did you notice he says, don't marvel at this. Don't be taken back by what I'm saying to you. And then he adds a further claim. In the future, he is going to give a command and every single person from every people group from all ages will raise from the dead. Regardless of the manner of their deaths, all will be raised to face judgment and at this judgment, there will only be two eternal destinies. You will have eternal life or you will have eternal condemnation. As verse 29 says, all people were raised to eternal life or eternal death. Of course, eternal life, if it's forever, what does that mean about eternal death? It's forever. And we need to make that distinction because there is a teaching out there, even in Christianity, that when you die, you're just, you, you cease from existence. It's called annihilation. You don't go into torment. There's no suffering. There's no pain. You're just, you just cease to exist. That's not found in Scripture. Now, look at verse 29. We need to deal with verse 29. He says, They will hear his voice, 
and they will come out. Now, notice what he says then. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, right? The basis of a person's judgment is their deeds. Now, when you first, first hear that, what does that seem to imply? How does God judgment judge us? It's based upon our, what? Works, right? And this verse has brought some confusion. Because at first glance, it seems to say that my eternal destination, where I'm going to spend eternity, is based upon what I do or what I don't do, right? I mean, isn't that what so many people believe about the gospel? They believe that, well, you know, I have as good a chance as anybody else. And, I, and God kind of, they picture God has this big scale. And, and on one side are my good deeds. And on one side are my bad deeds, things I know I've done wrong. And I hope to add more good deeds that will tip that scale and outweigh my bad deeds. And God will say, well, you know, this is pretty good. And, you know, that's what they think grace is. I'll throw a little grace in there on your good deeds and uh, that you'll be fine and you can come into heaven. Nowhere in Scripture does God teach that. And so what is he saying here? Well, this is where we always must interpret Scripture with more Scripture. And we always need to make sure we don't take a verse out of its context. We just don't grab one verse and say, well, here's what this means. We have to look at all of what John is saying. And verse 29 describes the lives of those who have already received new life in Jesus Christ because they put their faith in him, as opposed to those who have not put their faith in Jesus. They've already done that according to verse 24, right? That's how you get saved is verse 24. And throughout John's book, and even his later letters that he writes, John makes it abundantly clear that salvation is always by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Well, Leon Morris helps us understand what is John talking about here. He says, judgment, as always in Scripture, is on the basis of works. This does not mean that salvation is on the basis of good works. For this very gospel makes it plain over and over again that men enter eternal life when they believe on Jesus Christ. But the lives that they live form the test of the faith they profess. This is the uniform testimony of Scripture. Salvation is by grace and it is received through faith Judgment is based on men's works. Our works, meaning our life, it demonstrates what actual type of faith we have. Do we have a, a genuine faith in Christ or is it a fake faith? Our salvation, we don't earn that. Doing good works is a result of salvation. It's not the cause of salvation. Let me say that again. Doing good works is the result of salvation. It's not the cause of it. We need to make sure we don't put the, the, the cart before the horse. I'm told to do good works though, right? Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. It says we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And then it says, then you've been called to do good works, which were created in Christ Jesus. So don't think that the Christian life is not about doing works. It's just what is your motivation for doing the works? Do I do the works so I can earn God's favor? Or am I doing this out of love and gratitude because I've been given this free gift? But you will be judged for what you do and what you don't do. Even believers, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will have to give an account for our life 
And did we, what did we do with this free gift? How did we live for him? And he says he's going to take our deeds that we have done. And he says some of them will be burned up and they'll be like wood and hay and stubble. And he'll throw them in the fire and they'll burn up just like that. And Paul says that some will be like gold and other precious metals and jewels. They can stand the heat, can't they? They're not just going to burn up like straw. And God's going to test how we lived our life for him. And based upon that, we'll get rewards. And finally, verse 30 reveals that Jesus' judgment is just because he seeks the will of the one who sent him. Jesus not only didn't do anything on his own initiative, but he could not. And this really cements the point of really the entire section is his unity with the Father in all things. God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ are in complete agreement. There is no disagreement between them. The basis for judgment has been clearly laid out so that the question will be, what did you do with Jesus? That's the question that's going to be asked of you. What did you do with Jesus? And those who believe in him will escape condemnation. Those who don't believe have chosen condemnation. Hear me say this. No one on judgment day can actually complain that God is an unfair judge. Someone put it this way. Only God can judge you. And that should be one of the scariest truths in your life. Now, there's a lot of talk today about judgment, isn't there? But don't judge me. I mean, we love to throw that out there like, like air. Don't be judging me. The only one who can truly judge you is God. And that should actually scare you. Because he knows your heart. I don't know your heart. I can only see what you do or what you have done. I can only hear what you say. I can't judge the motives, but God can. I mean, think about it this way. Do you really want God to judge you based on your life and how you've lived it? Do you really want exactly what you deserve from the standpoint of a just, all-knowing judge I would say this I don't I do not want God to judge me based upon the way I've lived my life the things that I have done in my life I need Christ and I want Christ to judge me not based on my record but based on his record I want his mercy and he has promised to give it to me I'm not sure who said this, but I think it sums up this message really well. God doesn't send anyone to hell. He simply honors their choice. He honors their choice. So many people I would get angry with this, right? Why doesn't God do something about all this? How could a loving God send someone to hell? The answer is God has done something about it. And his name is Jesus. Really, another gospel question we often overlook in this is, what do I actually deserve? Have I violated God's word and his law? I have. Am I guilty of doing things wrong? I am. Then what do I deserve? I deserve punishment. But Jesus has taken my place. Jesus' work can be applied to my account if I put my faith and my trust in him. The question is, have you made that choice? Have you put your trust in him? Jesus Christ said this in John 6, 27. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. 
Jesus offers eternal life to whoever seeks it, but it's only found in him. The day is coming when you will be raised either to life or to judgment. And in light of who Jesus is, if I may speak plainly, you'd be stupid to live for this life alone while neglecting the free gift that will prepare you for the life to come. Are you ready for the resurrection? I had someone recently tell me that their, their sibling died just within the last couple months. And I asked, I said, did they know Christ? And they said, no. They did. I talked to them about Jesus Christ. I talked about where they're going to spend eternity. They died from, I think they died from cancer. And every time it came up, my sibling's response was simply, well, I got as good a chance as anybody. I hope God will accept what I have done. That was their answer. So many people are playing Russian roulette with their souls with a loaded, six loaded chambers. I mean, what happens when you do that? It's not a taking a chance. It's spinning and you, you know what's going to happen. No matter what chamber it lands on, you're going to end up dead. God says don't do that. There is a way to know the day that you have eternal life. And that's through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this truth. And I know, Lord, it is a heavy truth. Death is not something we like to talk about, not to, to like to think about, to be morbid. It's something that scares us, concerns us. But Lord, I, I think about what you've said here in your word. You are the hope we have in life and in death. You have conquered death. And we don't have to fear. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who hears the sound of my voice, not because my voice is anything, but may they have heard the word of God and respond to it. May they consider this question for themselves. Are they ready to die? Are they ready for the resurrection? And take it to heart, I pray. Holy Spirit, work. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.